Hello and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm your host, Neil Trotter, and today we're going to be bringing it back to some feminist theory because you may or may not know the Black Ponder is very passionate about feminism. We're going to do that via this text, The Creation of Patriarchy by Gerda Lerner. And I think this is a very powerful, interesting, and philosophical text. It does bring a lot of truth to the surface because what this text is basically saying, the meaning or the, the theme of the text is that patriarchy or this idea that men have always been dominant is not natural. Like It's not some innate human quality. This idea that men have been uh, the dominant and uh, women the subordinate where men are more the aggressor, the protector, the overseer and women are naturally more the support role, the submissive, the more emotional. That whole concept, uh, the concept of patriarchy, is a creation. It is not something that's just natural or instinctive. It is a human construct that began at some point in history, was developed over time, and is now so institutionalized in our society that it's hard to separate or understand that it, it actually is a, is a construct. It's a, sociological construct and it had a purpose a social economic political purpose now I know that's a, a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow I actually get comments all the time on the on YouTube where people say oh you know men are just naturally just they're the dominant uh, gender they're the dominant sex that's just naturally they're just more aggressive and women are just more in tune with their emotions and they're more support and they're you know, in general, more kind, and, you know, I get those comments often, especially on my uh, videos about feminist texts, and it's simply just not true. <laughs> it's not true. You know, there are a lot of women out there who are very in tune with their emotions, but there are also a lot of men out there who are, you know, are subordinate <laughs> by nature, or they're in tune with their emotions, and likewise, there's a lot of aggressive, dominant women out there, and it has really nothing to do with biology. It's just who they are as individuals. But Gerda Lerner examines when this type of idea, this concept of patriarchy first started in history, in human history, and then developed slowly over time to our current society today. And that time span is several millennia. And Gerda Lerner goes through this. Very powerful stuff. Let's begin with our first quote. Very interesting idea already. Gerda Lerner talks about how what feminism really is about or what feminist theory should focus more on is not this idea of women as the oppressed because there's a lot of women who actually benefit from the institution of patriarchy so listen to this women more than any other group have collaborated in their own subordination through their acceptance of the sex gender system they have internalized the values that subordinate them to such an extent that they voluntarily pass them on to their children some women have been oppressed, quotations, oppressed, in one aspect of their lives by fathers or husbands, while they themselves have held power over other women and men. Such complexities become invisible when the term oppression is used to describe the condition of women as a group. So we're, that's not to say, we're not, what we're not trying to do here is we're not trying to uh, shake, shake our fingers at women who are part of this patriarchal system or buy into the idea that uh, patriarchy is just some natural thing like shame on you women for d doing that no that's not what we're, we're trying to do here we're just trying to get to the truth we're trying to really understand the true nature of what's going on and when we study feminism and we and we look at women as the oppressed that's really not a truthful examination of what is actually going on the use of the phrase subordination of women instead of, of the word oppression has distinct advantages subordination does not have the connotation of evil intent on the part of the dominant it allows for the possibility of collusion between him and the subordinate it includes the possibility of voluntary acceptance of subordinate status in exchange for protection and privilege a condition which characterizes so much of the historical experience of women 
So that's very important to understand as we talk about this feminist theory and this idea of patriarchy as a creation. Women throughout history have voluntarily bought into that concept of patriarchy as natural or innate and have voluntarily subordinated themselves or put themselves in a subordinate role so they can reap other kinds of benefits, the types of benefits that patriarchy allocates, like economic privilege, like certain kinds of protections. Very important to understand as we move forward with this. Let's move on to our next quote. Once we abandon the concept of women as historical victims acted upon by violent men, inexplicable forces, and societal institutions, we must explain the central puzzle. Women's participation in the construction of the system that subordinates her. I suggest that abandoning the search for an empowering past, the search for matriarchy, is the first step in the right direction. This is another interesting quote I feel is, is important because now we're getting into the, I mean there's several things you can think about. Because we're talking about the idea of like a lot of women who are very anti-feminist, a lot of women who believe that feminism is just a rejection of the natural order of human behavior and the women who are feminists to struggle with that that battle but it also talks about the situation that went on particularly in early feminism where early feminists were trying to discover a matriarchal society or a some sort of society where women were the dominant <laughs> force at one time or when tribes, human tribes had like alpha females or something like that. What Gerda Lerner is saying is that we not we should abandon that idea too because it's a lot more complicated than that and it's not so simple. So each side is, is living in this kind of false sense of reality. And Gerda Lerner says with a clear study of or more careful and deeper understanding of human history we can start to understand the true nature of patriarchy and why it exists and the fact that it's not natural it didn't just happen at the dawn of humanity we'll go to our next quote now in most primitive societies of the past and in all hunter-gathering societies still existent today women provide on the average 60 percent or more of food to do so they often range far from home, carrying their babies and children with them. Further, the assumption that there is one formula and one pattern for the sexual division of labor is erroneous. The particular work done by men and women has differed greatly in different cultures, largely depending on the ecological situation in which the people find themselves. One thing that we still, in, currently in our society today, we still, a lot of people don't understand is we have this vision, a lot of people have this vision of early man <laughs> as, you know, the men went out and they, you know, they hunted big game like giant mam woolly mammoths or giant saber-toothed tigers and, you know, that's what men did, <laughs> you know, back in those days and they had huge spears and the women just stayed at home and raised the children. Uh, there were a few societies then that did that, but there was other societies that didn't do that at all. <laughs> you know, a lot of societies back in early human history, prehistory, before humans began to record their history, a lot of women went gathering for food, right? And they didn't ch chase after big game. They farmed or they looked for um, herbs to eat, fruits, vegetables, scavenged for a little small animals. Many, many societies back there was like that. So this whole idea of man as a strong uh, hunter that went out and like slayed these mighty beasts and had to return back to the their home to eat. This is kind of a myth and it, and it helps perpetuate this idea that men are naturally dominant and uh, aggressive and this strong hunter gender or sex. And all one has to do is really seriously look into studying anthropology or archaeology and if you seriously study that, you'll start to discover like, oh, okay, most societies back then were not like that. <laughs> so as you begin to study archaeology, anthropology more and more, uh, you get to understand like, okay, it, it wasn't, it didn't start out as men being com dominant aggressor 
and women as subordinate support role only. Right. In early human history, it didn't start out like that. Men and women were had different roles, but they were mostly equal in this whole dominant, subordinate uh, paradigm that we're talking about. Clearly, the link between childbearing and child rearing for women is culturally determined and subject to societal manipulation. My point, Gerder Lerner's point, is to stress that the earliest sexual division of labor by which women chose occupations compatible with their mothering and child raising activities were functional, hence acceptable to men and women alike. So here, what's being said is that um, there is a difference biologically between men and women and that biology has to do with women are the ones who bear the children. They're the ones that give birth. So there, because of that, there are certain roles that are more suitable or that has to, to be more customized to that biological uh, necessity. Now during that time, those roles weren't specifically more dominant or subordinate or anything like that. They were just roles that were more suitable for the women that had to bear children, had to carry the children. And that's, the, that's where it starts, that's the seed. It was this idea that there had to be some sort of differentiation between roles because of that biological necessity. That's when uh, uh, people who institutionalized patriarchy for the first time took advantage of this. And from that, started building upon this whole notion of men being more dominant, women being subordinate. It was more just a, a, a division of labor based off of a, a, just this biological function of childbearing. But patriarchy added a lot more fiction to that truth. The story of civilization is the story of men and women struggling up from necessity, from their helpless dependence on nature to freedom in their partial mastery over nature. In this struggle, women were longer confined to species essential activities than men and were therefore more, more vulnerable to being disadvantaged. My argument, the author's argument, sharply distinguishes between biological necessity to which both men and women submitted and adapted and culturally constructed customs and institutions, which forced women into subordinate roles. I have tried to show how it might have come to pass that women agreed to a sexual division of labor which would eventually disadvantage them without having been able to foresee the later consequences. So, and this is what we're talking about here. It was this biological necessity, childbearing, that women did, which uh, future people in power took advantage of to build upon a, a fiction of patriarchy that would support their power structures. This, in its most extreme form, is the end product of a long historical process of development. It began way back in prehistoric times, when the initial sexual division of labor imposed by biological evolutionary necessity demonstrated to men and women that distinctions could be made among people based on visible characteristics, such as childbearing. Persons could be ascribed to one group solely by virtue of their sex. It is this psychological social potential on which the later establishment of dominance depends. Under conditions of complementarity, mature independence, people would readily accept that sex-based groups would have segregate activities, privileges, and duties. Most likely the subordination of women as group to men as group, which must have taken centuries to become firmly established took place within a context of difference. Within each kinship group, the difference of the young toward the old. This form of difference, which is perceived as cyclical, therefore just, each person taking their turn at subordination and dominance, formed an acceptable model for group difference. By the time women discovered that the new kind of difference exacted from them, as was not the, of the same order, it must have been so firmly established as to seem irrevocable. So over time, throughout history, the idea of women as subordinate, men as dominant, was built upon. And it became so institutionalized that we now just assume that that's the case. But it wasn't the case at first. So what's the reason, the motivation why patriarchy was developed, why it was institutionalized? 
Well, a huge part of it has to do with this idea of property as capital, property rights. The husband enjoyed the management of his own and his wife's property during his lifetime, but he had to preserve his wife's dowry, both to guarantee an inheritance for his sons and to provide for her support in widowhood. The wife had a use right in her dowry and therefore had every interest in investing and augmenting it. This accounts for the business activity of patriotian <laughs> women, women who subscribe to patriarchy, and their considerable civic and economic rights. The seeming contradiction that upper class women had such economic rights, even as their sexual rights were increasingly restricted, is an integral aspect of the formation of the patriarchal family. So that's this idea of the ownership of property and land, home ownership, this idea started to develop because in early human history, humans didn't own, they didn't have this idea that people own land or to own or property. Humans were more nomadic. They just lived in whatever place they settled in and they moved around. But this idea of owning property was one of, was one of the primary catalysts that started to develop patriarchy or some sort of system that could foster or control the ownership of property to certain groups of people. Patriarchy was part of this whole idea of doing that. As time moved forward, women subscribed to patriarchy so they too could benefit from home ownership or property rights. Some women, women in power positions, economic power positions, all they had to do was subordinate. <laughs> subordinate their sexual position to their husband, or their brother or their father. And this is where this institution of patriarchy first starts. For women, class distinctions are based on their relationship, or absence of such, to a man who protects them, and on their sexual activities. The division of women into respectable women, who are protected by their men, and disreputable women, who are out in the street unprotected by men, and free to sell their services, has been the basic class division for women. It has marked off the limited privileges of upper class women against the economic and sexual oppression of lower class women. It has divided women one from the other. Historically, it has impeded cross class alliances among women and obstructed the formation of feminist consciousness. So Gerda Lerner argues that the sexual control of women is part of what patriarchy is all about. So women who are more controlled sexually are deemed more higher in society. They're more valuable. Valuable. Right. Women who are married, who only have sex with their husband, their significant other, who does not have sex before marriage, who has children with only one man, right? These are the women who are allowed the property. They, they are allowed the home ownership rights. These are the women who are allowed the capital of land and other economic privileges. Whereas women who are not married or who have sex with multiple partners, these are the people who are not allowed economic privilege. They're not allowed home ownership. It's harder for them to gain economic privilege. This type of situation was institutionalized uh, before Christ was born <laughs> right. and it was developed over time and this is the reason even today why marriage is considered so high and valuable culturally why, how, why it has such morally profound implications and why if, when you get married you can get all these government uh, benefits <laughs> right? and you get, a, you get a lot of economic uh, privileges when you're married too women who are more sexually controlled subordinate get more economic social privileges and that reality is what makes it hard for feminism to develop because it has to get over that huge hurdle it was a rational choice for women under conditions of public powerlessness and economic dependency to choose strong protectors for themselves and their children women always shared the class privileges of men of their class as long as they were under the protection of a man for women, other than those of the lower classes, the reciprocal agreement went like this. In exchange for your sexual, economic, political, and intellectual subordination to men, 
You may share the power of men of your class to exploit men and women of the lower class. In class society, it is difficult for people who themselves have some power, however limited and circumscribed, to see themselves also as deprived and subordinated. Class and racial privileges serve to undercut the ability of women to see themselves as part of a coherent group, which in fact they are not, since women uniquely of all oppressed groups occur in all strata of the society. The formation of a group consciousness of women must proceed along different lines. That is the reason why theoretical formulations which have been appropriate to other oppressed groups are so inadequate in explaining and conceptualizing the subordination of women. Feminism really is speaking truth and uh, philosoph philosophical take on feminism, feminist theory, is letting you know the true nature of reality. Human society is based off of the exploitation of certain people for the benefit of others. We have this class distinction as well as racial divides and gender biases is all based off of socioeconomic power and the fight for certain groups of people that have that power to maintain it. Okay, patriarchy is a tool for people uh, who have socioeconomic power to maintain that socioeconomic power. And there are people within that group, people of high socioeconomic class who are women, it's hard for them to understand the message of feminism because they reap the benefits that patriarchy gives because patriarchy maintains their high social economic advantage but ultimately it is at the expense of their sexual freedom their voluntary subordination so they can reap certain benefits at the expense of giving up other benefits and that's the reality of the situation it's important to study feminism I think and what feminism reveals feminist theory in this particular case it reveals the the structures of society how human society has institutionalized these forms of exploitation class advantage racial divide all to maintain power structures for certain groups of people and that's very important to understand because now we're getting at to the reality of what human society is all about and how what we can do to remedy all the problems and get rid of the, all this exploitation and all this domination and taking advantage of certain people to help uh, a select few raise up to the top. This is important to understand. So if you're one of those people that make the assumption that patriarchy, male dominance is, is something that's natural, you should check out this book, read this book, because it might throw you some curveballs that you have to really think about. Well, you've been listening to The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thoughts.